Hello and welcome to week two of Gareth Messenger Sports Talk and this week we will be reviewing the draw for both Euro 2012 and the FA Cup. My guests this week are Jake Gable who appeared on our show last week and Lewis O'Brien. Lewis, welcome to Sports Talk. First of all, um, can you explain who you are a little bit and what is your greatest sporting memory? Well, you, as you know, Gareth, I am the political reporter and winner. Still love my sport though, my earliest sporting memory. 98-99 um, season, last game at the Dell against Everton, Marion Bahars 2-1. To stay up had to be the best memory ever. Quite an interesting memory. I remember Marion Pahar's very good striker for Southampton in his time. Um, right, this week we had two important draws in the football world, as you both know, uh, the Euro 2012 draw and the FA Cup. Um, guys, if we start this week with the draw for next year, um, and England have France, Sweden and Ukraine, um, what do we think about that? Not an ideal group, but it's not the worst, is it, Jake? No, you know, absolutely. I think I think some of the calibre of the teams in there, we could have got a lot worse. France will no doubt sort of pose a test. I remember, obviously, we played them um, in our opening game of the last European Championships in 2004. Um, obviously, you know, quite a classic match now. Zidane's last two goals there in the last few minutes. But, you know, they're not, in my opinion, in my opinion, sorry, they're not the side they were back then in 2004. And I think, you know, they're there to be had a go at, really. You know, Sweden, average side, you know, we beat them recently. They've had the hold over us in recent years, but I think, you know, it's, it's a group we can get out of. And Lou, what's your view on that, uh, that group for England? It's, an, it's not a hard group, but it's not an easy group. If you look at all three teams, it just depends on what side turns up. If England turn up and play well, there's no reason why we can't get nine points. But if you look at it on paper... We've never we've not done well against France in major championships. We've never done well against Sweden in the major championships. And the last time we played Ukraine, we lost one nil. Um, you've got to remember at the same time as you've got we're we're playing in Ukraine, tra traveling to Donetsk, that's 870 well 800 miles from where we're staying in Krakow, which well we've seen the conditions this week. It's not great. It just depends on how we play. I think if we get past the group stage, we should do well, but it just depends. OK, um, who do we think is going to make Fabio Capello's squad next year? Because there are a lot of doubts over players such as Mika Richards, Daniel Sturridge and even Wayne Rooney, you know, his three-game ban in the Euros. Um, Lou, if we start with you, who do you think are the main names who would definitely be in that squad and who do you think the fringe players are for that for, for next summer? Uh, the definite names, well, Joe Hart's on the team sheet. He's always going to be on the team sheet. He's the only goalkeeper we've got, which is world-class. You look at the defence, Ashley Cole, he's going to be on the team sheet straight away. Ledley King, I would say we need to keep on this side, but it depends on how fit he is. You, uh, the midfield, you, I think maybe give Lampard and Jared one last go. You never know. What, I know they've never played well together for England, but maybe give it a go. And guys, there's uh, no denying what the group of death is. Group B, the Netherlands, Portugal, Germany and Denmark. Uh, that is some group, isn't it, Jake? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look back at the last World Cup, obviously just two years ago, um, the Netherlands made the final, Germany were there in the semis as well, very unfortunate to, to be knocked out by the eventual champion Spain. Uh, you know, Portugal, I don't think Portugal are the side they were, but obviously with Ronaldo in there, you know, they're always going to be a threat. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk um, writing off Denmark in that group, saying that they're going to be the whipping boys, you know, the wooden spoon. You know, I completely disagree with that. You know, they're a very strong side. They obviously pipped Portugal um, in qualifying for the championships. And, you know, they've got a really young sort of up-and-coming side full of talent, full of creativity. It's a very attacking side, and I'm sure they'll, they'll cause um, Germany, Portugal and Netherlands all sorts of problems. And uh, the, the Republic of Ireland in the Euros. Um, but it's not the best group for them, is it? Um, I think it's important we remember the self-belief and the team morale that Giovanni Trapattoni has installed there. Um they wouldn't be there if, it, if they weren't good enough. It is a hard group, but they always prove to be great games against the Italian, Italian, sorry, especially. So you never know. But of course, Spain and Croatia could prove problematic for the Irish. What do you think about that, Lou? I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're going to qualify at that group. I can't see Croatia and Italy turning up at all. Spain are the only threat. They may get they may get beat by Spain three four nil, but I can see them getting a good draw against Croatia and win against the Italians. So I can see them going through. Maybe maybe it's only on goal difference, but. Hopefully they can go as far as possible. Okay, and Jake, what do you think about the Irish's uh, chances in uh, Euro 2012? Yeah, I mean, the Italians are an ageing side. We know that. They've tried to install uh, some youth into the side recently, but I still don't quite think it's happening for them. They're not the side, obviously, they were um, a few a few years back. Looking back, at obviously, they won the World Cup in um, just five years ago. But, you know, looking at that side, you, you mentioned the self-belief there and, and the team morale, Gareth, and I think that's always a really important part of the of the Republic of Ireland squad. Uh, looking back at the, the 2002 World Cup, going back some time now, and I remember they, they snatched a draw against the Germans. And I think with the Irish, it's always down to that 
spirit and that morale they have in their camp and, and that should you know stand them in good stead again this time around. Yeah, it's mainly led by, of course, uh, Robbie Keane, Shea Given, Richard Dunn, the, you know, the old guard of Ireland, really. But they are bringing through the, the youth ranks, you know, I mean, Aidan Aiden McGeady's 25 now, but, you know, he's not really, you know, he's young enough to be in that squad to regard as a younger player. Um, so, as I said, Trapattoni, I personally believe that Ireland will qualify. Um, from the group stages, um, I think they've got they've got the squad, but it's key they keep the players like Keane, Doyle fit. Um, you know, McGeady, for example, O'Shea. They've got to keep those players fit and well. Um, the Italians, as you said, Jake. You know, they are an aging squad. Uh, of course, they have the the talent in Montalivo. They have Gilardino still. They have Balotelli, who is an absolutely outstanding footballer. Um, but his temperament can be an issue. The Croatians are very, very good when it comes to qualifying for the Euros and the World Cups, but I think in the actual competitions they struggle, and that that, that will be their downfall, regardless of the players of Cranchar, Modric, and um, Eduardo. Um, so who are we predicting to win the Euros next summer, Jake? If we start with you. Um, I'm I'm going to go out and, and say this straight away. A lot of people have been tipping Spain, but I really fancy the Germans. Um, they showed us, obviously, in South Africa last summer, that you know they've got a great squad, very young, very up and coming. You know they're full of attacking talent. They're well drilled at the back, and I think the time has come. You know, as as much as Spain have been dominating world football over the last few years, as we saw with France in the early 2000s, their time must come to an end at some point. And I see no reason why why the Germans can't stop that run now. Obviously they've got, you know, um, Mesut Ozil in there, Thomas Muller, uh, Tony Cruz has come through, Schweinsteiger's captain in the side now at the moment. He's doing a great job. You know, Mario Gomez up front, he's, he's been on absolute fire this year. And, yeah, I, I really fancy the Germans, Gareth. Um, obviously, we know they do very well at major tournaments, and, and I think this could be their year again. Jake's gone for Germany. What about you, Lee? Um, I was going to say Germany, but the way that Robin Van Persie's been performing, I think you know, this could be a one-man show from Robin Van Persie. At the end of the day, he's been playing so well in the Premier League for Arsenal. The Netherlands are always going to the major tournaments. The World Cup final last year, they've got a good, strong back line. I just, I just think personally, with the way he's playing, the way he's playing for Arsenal, the way he's playing in the Premier League, in the way he's been playing in the Champions League, I can't see past it. I think at the same time, conditions, the condition in, the, in Poland and in the Ukraine could play into the favour of the Netherlands because it's a very similar climate. OK, you've gone for Holland. Um, Jake, you've gone for Germany. Um, I'm going to go for a different choice. I'm going to go for France. I think they've been rejuvenated under Laurent Blanc. Um, they've got the players like Nasri, um, Invilia. They've got Adil Rami, um, you know, and I think they've got a very young and up-and-coming squad. And I think Blanc is working um, that squad its hardest, really, to be prepared for Euro 2012. So France, Germany and Holland here are the decisions. So um, very interesting choices. Let's move on to the FA Cup and the draw at the weekend, Sunday, obviously. Manchester City, Man United. What a tie that is in the third round. Um, Lou, that's massive, isn't it? Yeah, of course it's massive. It's the big, it's going to be the biggest third round tie we've seen in years. Um, maybe the biggest third round tie since Man U Chelsea a few years ago. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this: whoever wins this game is going to win the FA Cup, and whoever loses this is going to win the league. I feel that priorities. If you look at tonight, in the if you look at this week in the Champions League, Man City, I, they want to qualify, but I think deep down, if they get take if they get knocked out of the competition at the group stage, they've got more time to focus on the FA Cup and more time to focus on the league. So I think. City have got the be have got the better team, but I don't think it's going to be a repeat of what happened in the league over this season. So I'm going to go with the man you win in that case. Okay, Jake, what do you reckon for that game then? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just going to disagree with Lou slightly there. On the fact I understand what you're saying about you know I, I guess the cups cup competitions can be can be a distraction sometimes for the bigger sides. But I think in in the rivalry r sorry the rivalry we have between these two at the moment, you know I'm sure a victory is going to perhaps prove a psychological edge as well in the title race. Um, you know, it's very, very hard to pick a winner between these two. It's 50-50 usually when they meet. And United obviously had, had the hoodoo sign over City um, in recent years up until that remarkable victory um, at Old Trafford just last month. I'm going to have to go with City. The form they're in, you know, they really are irrepressible at the moment. But, you know, I think one thing is for sure we're, we're in for one hell of a tie. And Jake, uh, replica tie for Arsenal, isn't it? Leeds United in the third round. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I remember last year we had some problems seeing off Leeds. You know, they're a well-drilled unit. We know that. They're very good side, very solid, going well in the championship, and, and they'll cause us problems again. We're at home, and I'd have to fancy us. Um, 
Although obviously last year, you know, we had to take them to a replay at Allen Road and, and relied on, on Cesc Fabregas for a last minute penalty there to save our blushes at the Emirates. We don't have Fabregas this year, but, but as Lou mentioned, obviously just a, a few minutes ago, we do have Robin Van Persie. And as long as he stays fit, you know, I, I think he's every inch the talisman that, that Fabregas was for us. And I'm sure he'll, he'll fire us through to that fourth round. And uh, Lewis, you're a Southampton supporter. Uh, Coventry away, are you happy with that? To be honest, no, I'm not happy with that. It's just going to feel like another championship game. If, if you look at how we played at Coventry away this season, good first half, just w went 2-0 up. What I'm worried about in this game is, though, our, it's away. Um, so Hampton's away form isn't that good at the moment. If, to be fair, we're luck we are still lucky to be at the top because St Mary's has been a fortress to us. If I, want, if I wanted to be honest, I hope we lose the game because I want us to concentrate on the, on the league. I think we still have a chance to go up. I don't think we'll win the league, but I still think we've got a good chance of going up automatically in second. OK, and um, Chelsea, my side, obviously, will be playing Portsmouth at Stamford Bridge. Um, it's a couple of good ties for lower league opposition as well. Tamworth, uh, non-league Tamworth, are away to Everton, which will be a great tie for the Blue Square Premier side. Um, League 2, Bristol Rovers and Gillingham host Aston Villa and Stoke City, respectively. And a return to Gillingham for Tony Pulis, who used to manage at the Jills. Uh, but you'd have to predict wins for the Premier League sides there, don't you, Lou? Uh, no. I would say Everton are going to win. I'd definitely say Villa are going to win. Stoke, you're probably going to see an upset there. There's, they're in one too many competitions at the moment. They're going to, they've, with the team they've got is a good side, but eventually you're going to have to burn out. You can't be playing Premier League on a Saturday, Europa League on a Thursday, and then an, F, an FA Cup game on a, on a Friday or a Saturday again. If looking at this, I hope the upset of the round could be in that tie. Gillingham have got a good side. They did well against Bournemouth in the replay. Made them look very, very amateur. I think Gillingham might be the team to have a surprise run this season. Jake, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you know... Stoke obviously have been in fantastic form, um, you know, doing really well in the Europa League, beat Dynamo Kiev obviously just, just last week. But with that, I agree with Lou, you know, comes a certain expectation that, you know, Tony Pulis, you know, he's no mug, he'll know that they can't compete in every competition and, and go for every front. And I wouldn't be too surprised to see a second string maybe turn up there at Gillingham. And, you know, I might fancy them for a result. They've they've been impressive at Priestfield and you know, looking down, looking down the fixture list there, um, Tamworth, you know, it's been a great run for them. I'm sure Everton will see them off, really. That's their bread and butter competitions like this. And Bristol Rovers um, hosting Aston Villa. Uh, it would have obviously been great for us as, uh, as here in Winchester for, for um, Aston Villa to be travelling to Totten, but, but for a shame it wasn't to be at the weekend. Yeah, you mentioned that. And, of course, Bristol Rovers did overcome AFC Tottenham on Sunday in front of the live ITV cameras. Um, it was a 6-1 win for Paul Buckle's side. Um, but you could say the score was rather flattering, really, because Tottenham gave them a good show, didn't they, Jake? Yeah, you know, Tottenham turned up and, and they really played their hearts out. And they were very unlucky to, to just go down to three exceptional goals, really, in, in a five-minute spell. And after that, they were, they were dead and buried and, and there was no way back for them, really. You know, regardless of quality, I think that's just a psychological thing that once you concede three like that, it's, it's always going to be difficult. Lou, what did you make of the game on Sunday? It was a, it was a shame to see Tottenham go out, really, because they did play well. Well, personally, knowing Grant Porter, the goalkeeper, I thought it was really unlucky for him. He played. He had. He played. He was the man in the match, in my opinion. Played a fantastic game. If it wasn't for him, it could have been ten, eleven. I think the first three goals in the first thirteen minutes did kill the game off. Every goal, maybe apart from the fifth from Bristol City, was a world-class goal. So the score wasn't flattering, but I think Tottenham had to be proud of what they were doing. They'll go up this season. I think they'll go from strength to strength next season in the conference itself. Fair enough. Um, I I did find it. I was at the game Sunday. Um, I did find it surprising that Stefan Brown started over Michael Charles. Um, do we agree with that? I mean, should Richie have started with Charles? He'd been been in such good form for Tottenham over the last two years. Um, I think it depends how you look at it. Stefan Brown had an amazing tie in the first round. Destroyed Bradford Park Avenue. Three goals in the fastest fastest FA Cup hat trick by a substitute in history. I think you just go with what you know. He, he proved he had a good game. He'd been playing well the last few league games. I think you had to start with Stefan Brown because he had the pace. Um, Br Bristol Rovers weren't the quickest side in the world, but then obviously they brought out the two wide men who destroyed Totten. So I think initially, to begin with, Stefan Brown was the right choice. OK, and Jake, well, what do you think about uh, Brown starting over Michael Charles? Yeah, Richie, you know, he's a, he's a good manager and I'm sure we'll have to respect the decision. He knows what he's doing, he knows his players and he knows his squad. Um, Charles has been going well for them. Obviously, they've been impressive in the league. But I don't think you can ignore Brown after... after as Lou just mentioned, his you know his fantastic form in the last round of the cup. 
you know, I think any striker who who can manage to come off the bench and, and annihilate the opposition like that is always banging on the manager's door for a starting place. Um, and that was the case for Stefan Brown at the weekend. You know, it was perhaps a decision based on his pace. Obviously, he's a, a pacey lad, uh, Brown. And, you know, on a, on a pitch like the Test would, I, I'm sure, you know, Bristol weren't too... The centre-backs weren't, you know, too familiar with playing on, on such a, a stodgy surface. And, you know, maybe that was it. On the day, it, it didn't come off. But, you know, I'm sure if it had, they, they would have been singing Richie's praises. Well, there's no denying the energy that Brown has. You know, he's a student at Portsmouth University. He's a young lad. You know, he's got that, he's got that energy. He's got that drive about him. But I see him more as an impact player who can create havoc later on in the game with tired legs around. And I think that would have been more beneficial. But Stuart Ritchie, as you said, went along with what he knew. And as you said, Lou, that he has been playing well in the league recently. And Charles hasn't been scoring goals. Um, but I think Charles is, you know, league experience, uh, sorry, non-league experience with teams like Woking and Basingstoke should have you know, should and probably would have given him the edge over Brown but you know um, the decision was made and probably Charles was brought on too late in the game with 10 minutes to go what do you make of that Lou? Um, I look at it at the beginning of the game Brown was against Adam Virgo Virgo is an ageing man now he was quali- he was very good at Brighton didn't do too well at Celtic but when you look at the, t- the game as marker Brown was going to win every time I think ch- bringing Charles on with what, 10 minutes to go Maybe if he had got one or two goals, it would have still been what six, six, two, six, three. It would have made a difference. So just bringing on them to give him that moment. So obviously give them that moment in the sunlight for ten minutes. But I don't think it would have made a difference if you had brought him on at halftime. Uh, Jay, what do you make of that? Because I mean, Charles does have that impact, and he does work well with the players like Jonathan Davies and Michael Gosney. Um, do you think he was brought on too late? Do you think he could have changed it if he had come on at halftime? No, I think Charles, if anything, is is more of a, a player to start from from the off. You know, he's a team player and works very well. He's he's got good link up play, holds the ball up better than Brown. Uh, I agree with with the the idea that Brown is more of a super sub, um, somebody to come off come off sort of in the last ten ten or so minutes. But I think at that point, you know, it was all over for Totten, if we're being honest. And I think it was just it was a run out for Charles at that point. And um, it was a great goal by Nathaniel Sherborne. They deserved it, really. I mean, they, they had uh, chances cleared off the line. Jonathan Davies um, even hit the bar as well, I believe. Um, you know, they, they had the chances and they didn't come. That's the FA Cup. That's the beauty of the FA Cup. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, but a great header by Sherborne, wasn't it? And they deserved it, didn't they, Jake? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we said, Totten played well on the day. Gosney was dangerous yet again. You know, how long until he gets snapped up by, by one of the bigger clubs? But... I think on a day like that, you know, Nathaniel Sherborne will just be pleased to say, you know, he scored in the FA Cup and, you know, they did themselves proud. They did the home side proud and, and people watching despite the scoreline, you know, as Richie suggested, it, it was a it was a good performance to, despite the uh, the 6-1 scoreline. And it's, it's not often we say that, but Totten can, can hold their, their heads up high and hopefully, you know, they'll have a run like this again in future. And Lou, what do you make of um, Nathaniel Sherborne's header? Um, to bring the score back to 4-1. It was a good header. I think it was probably maybe the go- maybe the goal of the game from a technical aspect, but it wouldn't. It was not from them to get a goal. It, cha- it did change the game to a point, but it was never going to be Tottenham coming back and maybe going to four all at the end. I think you look at their side. They've done well. They've got to the second round. The side the side they've got at the moment is in the wrong league. They're not a Southern Premier side. They are a Conference South side. I would go out on a limb and say maybe 12 months' time they will be better than East. They may even be better than Basingstoke. They could be the the best non-league side in Hampshire within 12 months. I think they are the next side to look out for. Yeah, well, um, AFC Totten, of course, are playing uh, tonight on Tuesday. They're away to Ferrum Town in the Hampshire Senior Cup. Um, but they are out of the FA Cup. It's a terrific run. And I believe a lot of those players will surely be seen in professional football soon. I mean, the likes of Michael Gosney, as you said, Jake, Michael Charles, even Jonathan Davies. They're very talented players. And I don't think it's long before we see them in professional or even, you know, even just higher ranks of non-league um, well that is all for this week on Gareth Messenger Sports Talk um, a big thank you to my guests Jake Gable and Lewis O'Brien thank you very much guys thank you um, stay tuned next week we'll be talking about all the sporting news locally nationally and of course across the world thank you very much and goodbye <laughs>